My name is Chris Farmer. I am the founder of a firm called Sapphire. And I had worked in traditional venture for um, the better part of uh, 15 plus years. I worked for a couple of the major sort of traditional venture firms, Bessemer Venture Partners, and then more recently General Catalyst. And back when I was at Bessemer, it just felt backwards to me, to be totally honest. We were supposed to add value to portfolio companies, and we got no leverage, no technology. We weren't measured on that. We weren't held accountable to it. We weren't compensated for it. And so, you know, you, you have a talent partner, and there's 200 portfolio companies, and like, just on the, um, it's just a joke um, that we're really going to be able to move the needle for portfolio companies. And so it felt very disingenuous to me working with founders that, hey, we're really going to add a lot of value because I didn't believe what I was selling. And so, um, so I left the venture industry in 2009 and said, you know what, we're going to start from first principles. I had been covering the App Store and I'd been an entrepreneur before that. And you know, we started to, I started to try to apply data in about 2007 to the venture industry just because I was covering this App Store that had hundreds of apps for a while, and I was doing it manually. Then it became thousands of apps and became hundreds of thousands of apps. I'm like, are you joking me? Like, am I really supposed to like, see what's moving up manually? Can we create a leaderboard, for God's sakes? You know, and anyway, so it, it just became clear that the traditional venture firms were just not geared to use any technology in any meaningful way. And we were investing in companies using networks and data and technology and workflow and all this kind of stuff which we're still doing to this day, and yet we thought we were immune from the same forces for the same reasons. And so, I don't know, the entrepreneurial instinct kicked in, and it was just like, I've got to try to do something about this. Um, I want to really feel good about that we're moving the needle for the founders that we're working with. So um, I took a year off in 2009, hired six researchers, and we just started interviewing founders. And we interviewed about 500 founders, 170 funds from seed accelerators to venture to buyouts to quant funds to corporate and everyone and said what are all the best practices from everyone and how do we pull all that together and then really hold ourselves accountable to do that and and so i ended up partnering with a firm called general catalyst partners to open their west coast office because i didn't want to do any back office i don't want to do fundraising finance all the stuff that you guys couldn't care less about um, and i just wanted to focus 100 percent on the front office entrepreneur facing things and just sort of iterate and hopefully find product market fit on that. So they were my single limited, that it wasn't apparent to people on the outside that it was a separate organization. And I was a, a partner on the main fund as well, but we started the seed fund and we just focused in on talent. It was the single biggest pain point of every company, it didn't matter stage, sector, geography, like recruiting amazing people was the biggest pain point. And so I ended up uh, starting just focusing on that and we said, okay, we're gonna start using data. I'd been an investor in LinkedIn. I'd been an investor in a company that became a key part of Google. And uh, just said, how do we find the best people to help provide that at scale for our portfolio companies? So I founded a, a talent firm. And so everyone thought I was a talent partner for like a couple of years. And, and we just said, you know, we're gonna find individual contributors as well as key executives, advisors. I'm just gonna try and stack the team as much as possible. And just using that one wedge to support founders, just one thing that we were gonna do really well, we were able to get into a pretty amazing array of companies uh, very early on from like Snapchat to Stripe to you know, Discord and a bunch of others. Uh, and so at that point I felt like we had enough product market fit and that there were still a lot of limitations to that. That was only like solving a key pain point but not the only pain point. So, um, so I ended up spinning out in 2013 and just going heads down and how do we build this in a scalable way? And so that I had founded a talent firm alongside the seed fund to, so we had 11 recruiters for two venture capitalists. And so nine technical, two executive. And we said, okay, we're just gonna do this at scale. And then that just kept building on itself and the problem became so insatiable that that little appendage to my seed fund actually is now the largest executive search firm in the world in tech, about 375 recruiters. <laughs> It's sort of an insatiable problem. Like, okay, like clearly, like manually, this is not going to work. You've got to use a systems approach to doing that. So when we founded Signifier, a key part of it was focused on talent, but then we also sort of added in a lot of other domains. So today, we track more data on startups than anyone in the world by a very wide margin. Um, we process about $3 trillion worth of consumer spend, about 14 million credit cards a day. So we can see where people are spending money, every app, every download, all the online engagement. We decompile every app and every website so we can see all the infrastructure they're using. 
We track almost everyone in the Western world that works in tech, about 40 million people, about 14 million engineers, all individually ranked by about 70 subdimensions of engineering with real-time movements, predictions of when they're going to change jobs, and all of the like. So we would do things a little differently than the rest of the venture firm. <laughs> um, so for the first three years, we were nothing but engineers and me. Um, and today, we have about, about a third of the team is engineering, about nine in engineering. And, um, and so we just basically are building a full stack venture firm. We, we collect data like Google. We use data more like Uber. So we've got networks of people. We use data and networks and workflow and collaboration, very much like a three-sided marketplace with sort of founders being on one side. Then we have a network of about now 75 plus advisors. Um, and then the fund itself. Um, and we use that to support companies at scale. So we've actually gone completely full stack. We've built a full SaaS recruiting platform with ATS integration and you know, similar people, predictions when people can change jobs, phone numbers, contact information, and everything. So we can support to scale hundreds of companies and thousands of recruiters in real time. And then we also use that data to support larger companies. So we have hundreds of corporate uh, companies that we have relationships with about maybe half of the Fortune 100 have been clients in the last five years. And so we just have a completely different model. And it's all about building large ecosystems. And our advisors are basically the who's who of Silicon Valley. Everyone from like Kevin Hartz to Ali Pertobi to Max Levchin to Pierre Midyar to Jerry Yang to Stuart Butterfield to Mac Mike Olson to Ross Mason and so on and so forth. So um, you know, at the end of the day, it's always funny that founders come to you and they're like, oh, I have a product problem. Sure, let's whiteboard. I got to think through pricing. Okay, no problem. I got that too. You know, it's like, help me close a candidate. Okay, yeah, I'm on it. And it was just like ridiculous that you're like a Swiss Army knife trying to do everything. So we were actually architected fundamentally differently, like a network. We, we see ourselves more like general practitioners, and we're responsible for whole life working with founders, but then we refer out to specialists who can frankly do the job much better than we can. So our pricing guy runs pricing for Salesforce, our M&A guy ran M&A, tech M&A for Credit Suisse and Morgan Stanley, our patent person ran patents for Google, and so on and so forth. And so you end up getting world-class advice at each of those functions in a much more scalable way. And then these advisors have been in the industry forever, and yet they've never gotten much more than a latte from the venture firms. They've been introducing like, all the best deals to the venture firms for like 30 years, and they like, pick up the tab for your coffee um, in return. And so really they do it because they love founders, they want to help them, not because the venture firms treat them well. And so we decided to invert that equation they own about a third of the firm. They're about 100 million of the funds. And so they're deeply aligned with what we do. They get to use the systems and the platforms. We do all sorts of things on collaboration and workflow. And we often bring them in collaboratively in deals, depending on what the needs of a founder are. So do we, we suggest people to the founder, and then they pick the people that they think can augment the team in the early phases. So it's, uh, that's sort of how we started the firm. It's been a, quite a wild ride since we launched our first fund. Our first check was January 2015. We've raised close to a billion dollars since then and flied, flown way under the radar by design. Sort of the cat's a bit out of the bag at this point. Um, but we didn't have a website until 2017. Um, so we were, we were in stealth mode for about seven and a half years. Um, but anyway, so it's a, it's a fundamentally different approach to venture. And it's just been awesome because it really resonates with founders. We're able to materially move the needle um, from their own sort of uh, validation of that and feedback and you know NPS score and those types of things. We measure every microservice we run it like the Ritz Carlton would run service. We measure the spa experience, the check-in experience, the turn down service, et cetera. But in our case it's pricing, competitive intelligence, seven different layers of talent and so on and so forth. And the goal is just to add the most value in the venture industry. And we believe that if we do that, We'll be able to get into amazing opportunities and support great founders, and that will end up doing well on the investment side as well. So, very cool. That is the, the uh, crux of the firm. Pretty exciting, and obviously very different than everything that exists. Um, from the system that you've built, have there been certain signals that you've picked up on that might not have been very obvious that led you to decisions or investments that you otherwise like wouldn't have seen? Yeah. So. Um, so a lot of people ask the question, like, what is the main signal or whatever, other than talent, which is sort of a more universal one. Even then, it depends on the kind of opportunity. What you would look for in a storage company is completely different than a social network. Um, 
you know, it, 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 we've actually, it's been amazing. It's all been first principles. We actually file a bug every time we miss a deal um, that gets done by another firm. And then the tech team and the research team look at, could I have found that? Is there a data source? And so we've ended up discovering a bunch of data sources that no one's ever used in this industry as a result of that. Um, and that's just on the, the sourcing side of it. But, you know, it, it, we end up with tons of data sources that have never been applied to an industry like this. Um, that are used more for like, you know, enterprise marketing, or they're, they're used for, um, you know, just normal day-to-day -day business of, of companies. Um, and we're just trying to synthesize, like, if I were the CEO of this company, what would I be looking at, um, you know, in order to understand how well my business is running? Because that, for us, is an early warning signal of like, hey, like, where can we intervene and perhaps augment a founder or a team to help them eliminate blind spots and help accelerate them? But a huge amount of, of the resources goes into portfolio support specifically on how do you build scalable systems to you know, bring them better dashboards so that they know outside of what's happening in their own four walls where they sort of fit in the grander context, how they augment the team, how they get connected to the right advisors or the right you know, potential customers or those types of things. And so you know, it's, it's, it's always hard to say. We've, we've discovered tons of things. There's over 10 million different sources of data at this point, about 80 primary. So we basically build crawl infrastructure like Google, and we just go out and figure out what do we need and then go build the data, collect it. And then like 90% of the work is un, you know, taking that unstructured data and doing data janitorial work until we process it, canonicalize it, you know, deduplicate it, et cetera, and make it structured enough that you can now apply it in the system. And, and that's why other people don't do this is because it's... <laughs> It's really messy and takes forever and is a lot of work. So, uh, it's really impressive. Um, so, obviously, one of the biggest pain points for founders of any stage of a company is hiring amazing talent, um, and that was seems like kind of your like wedge to this market. Um, since then, what are other pain points that you've identified, and then what's kind of your firm's approach to solve that? So, I mean, it, it's we we. Founders ask us for help on different things. If it, it gets asked more than a handful of times, we then go to create as much of a dedicated resource there as we can. Um, so it's everything from you know, different types of growth hacking. We have consumer viral, consumer transactional, SMB bottoms up, enterprise. We have pricing. We have all sorts of go-to-market functions on the sales side, fields up, um, you know, uh, demand gen, all that kind of stuff. We have large scale enterprise relationships to do, and particularly channels. Mm -hmm. So everything from like app, all the distribution channels like app stores and social networks, et cetera. We have connections into the, how to navigate like the app store to get promoted and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I mean, it's just, it's, it becomes pretty myriad because I mean, it's internationalization. How do you enter certain markets, all that type of thing. And so just by building a bigger and bigger network, we have somebody you might not use very often but you can refer out to that. So again, to use that general practitioner analogy, it's, we look at it more like how Stanford Hospital or whatever would be run. We're the general practitioner. He's like, you need a phlebotomist or an oncologist or a radiologist or a podiatrist. Like, you just have one of each of those. All right? And we just keep stacking the deck. And these are people who are not normally drawn into the venture industry. But, and they're not used necessarily that often. But it's awesome to have them sort of centralized within an organization and then sort of available across you know, the 50 plus companies, now approaching 100 companies that we've backed. That's huge. And you guys have obviously been able to fly under the radar for a while, the cat's out of the bag, but in that time, you know, from the companies that you mentioned, it sounds like you've been in some amazing deals. Uh, is there certain like, patterns or signals that you see about founders at this, at this early stage where you start to get to a clue that they will be very successful? Yeah, I mean, we're super founder-driven. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just having a conversation with some VC friends. I mean, like, a bunch of the best investments that we've made have been companies that started with the absolute wrong thesis, wrong business model, and then they were heat-seeking missiles and eventually found their way to finding product market fit and what business models worked. I mean, if you look, obvious examples are Groupon or Slack or, you know, I mean, all these companies started in like radically different group, Google, you know, all of Amazon, all of these companies. And so, you know, so we, we spend a lot of extra time trying to understand the team dynamic. Um, how, you know, what sort of adversity have these people faced? How have they handled that adversity? 
they may be first time founders, but they're rarely first time leaders. Mm. Um, so, you know, if you go through life and you're 35 years old and you've never taken a stand on something, <laughs> and whether it be like a college leadership thing or just adversity on a job, like chances are this isn't going to be different. Um, but you find tons of people, even that are very young, that have taken hacks at things and you know, it doesn't mean that they had a huge success. It may have been that they created a nonprofit or that they, you know, had, a, you know, a talent acquisition where they had no business starting a company in the first place, you know, from the outside world. And, and these are the types of people we love to back and then do our best to sort of bring amazing people behind them to help them sort of fulfill the vision that they have. Mm -hmm. and, and at this early stage, how much is kind of that founding team versus the market or the idea? say 80% founding team. Yeah. Um, it's nice to have a market with tailwind and not like full on headwind. It's, it's really hard to defy that. But you know, I, I've, I've backed companies that I had like literally no interest in the business that they were in, but I was so compelled by the story that, of adversity or whatever that they'd gone through and their determination and persistent and perpetual learners and they're just reinventing themselves and just grit and determination. And you just, you gotta back those people. Mm. You know, and so that's, that's we're, we're a super talent-driven organization. And one of the huge advantages of the network that's sort of a hidden secret of that is we literally built a graph of the valley. And so we know the people that previously backed them or worked, they worked for or, you know, um, um, that went to the same university or whatever it is. And we triangulate a lot on the people themselves. And, and when you're managing their money, they're a little more candid than uh, if it's a cold, you know, sort of reference. So... That's been one of the sort of really positive things for us to really understand what drives the people underneath because, you know, as, as Rushi was talking about the people here, you know, it's, it's about following your passions and about what doesn't matter if it's geeky or edgy or feels like a toy in the beginning. That's where a lot of amazing industries have started and the people who are like chasing the money, like that's usually not what moves the needle for the world at the end of the day, so. Seems like, uh so much of venture in the past has been based on reputation or past success, and you've really taken this first principles approach to like what the firm is, you know, of the future. Um, thinking about today, what do you see as being one of the biggest pains within venture, um, from both like the point of view of the founder and then of a LP as well? So if I'm, I'm brutally candid, I think too much of the venture industry has become heat seekers. Like, oh, this is hot, or this has got velocity behind it, and whatever, and like, it's like, it's like chasing the popular kid. You know what I mean? It's like, that's not particularly interesting to me. Um, we love founding people w with like deep conviction in their ideas, with some unique insight, and sort of product, you know, f or founder fit, or founder market fit, whatever you want to call it. Um, that just have shown an insatiable sort of, you know, passion irrationally for learning and geeking out about that space, and then just trying to sort of augment that. Um, and we're so early that there's rarely velocity behind a deal, and so we think we see ourselves much more as builders, and like the sort of pit crew to help founders launch. Mm. And I honestly like tune out and fall asleep once it like is launched and like it starts to be like okay, like let's land and expand a little bit and like. Expand around the fridges, add a new geography. That's just not what I love personally. Um, I, I love that sort of formational and the roller coaster, and um, and really sort of being there for the highs and lows of the beginning. I guess I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie from that standpoint. <laughs> and as soon as it becomes a little more paint by numbers, and now it's just a matter of scaling, we have certainly members of the team on our later stage fund that, that focus on that and do an amazing job. But it's just it's not what lights me yeah. up, you know. So. It, it really seems like you treated the fund as its own kind of startup. Um, was there, or I'm, I'm sure that there was adversity when you first started. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious like what that adversity was and then how you pushed through. Oh, we were idiots when we started this. I mean, like, I literally met with um, you know, uh, a founder of a extremely high profile firm, Benchmark, uh, that like literally it was a seven minute meeting. This is the worst idea <laughs> I have ever heard. This is not possible. You're a, oh, this is, oh, it's even worse. Like it was like after like five minutes is the, like the shortest meeting I've ever had. I was like, you know what? 
I did not come here to like antagonize you. I'm, I'm just gonna like, I'm gonna call this and, and, and leave. And you know, and it's just like a lot of the firms that are established, like they've had their way, their playbook and whatever. And, and you know, it works for them. I mean, it's obviously an incredibly successful firm and I don't mean to just, you know, to, to, to talk smack. Um, it's actually a former partner there, it's not a current partner. Um, and you know, just, there, there was just the, oh, it's a cottage industry, it needs to be hand done. But if you go and talk to the founders, like everyone loves their venture capitalists at least openly. And then they think everyone else is an idiot in the venture industry. Well, not an idiot, but they don't think they're that value add. And so, you know, like, I mean, really we gotta get off our high horse. So I'm like, are we really the best person to help a founder in all these different problems that they're having? And it was my experience 20 years ago running a company relevant to the founders today. And the reality is the person who's good at writing an investment is not necessarily the person who's gonna be great at advising on scaling sub, sub function of your company. And so a current practitioner in that space who knows what the Facebook ads platform looks like right now or who has the sort of most modern network in you know, a, a certain domain or the latest architecture is gonna be way better at that stuff. Um, and you need to give them context and everything else and have enough continuity of the relationship that they can learn your, you know, enough of your business to help on that. But the founder feedback is decisive that you know, the finance folks that are great investors are not necessarily <laughs> the, great people, the best people to advise. There are certain exceptions in the industry and, we're, and a lot of VCs are great at some things, fundraising, some strategic things and pattern recognition over time. But as far as tactical execution of actually how to do these things, you know, we, we fall short. And, and I think we have to sort of own up to, just most people have never even measured it, you know, so how do they know? And so that, that, that was sort of a key learning for us in all of this, is just to get the ego aside, and there's probably someone better than, than me to do that, and step out of the way and let them, let them do it. That's huge, that's huge. You you're obviously um, have a really interesting view of the whole market, not, you know, not only with all of the companies that pitch you every day, but also with, with all of the data that, that you're collecting and all of the signals. Are there certain trends or markets or areas that are exciting to you and why? I mean, look, I mean, there, there's a ton of consumer phenomena that are, that are super interesting, shifts in buyer behavior, those types of things. And that's where we look for sort of market tailwinds. You've seen a lot of you know, interesting things happen in sort of the no code movement of you know, like allowing more lay people that were not, you know, you know, CS majors, undergrad, to actually, you know, manipulate the tools that they're using without having to like put a ticket out to IT and like wait for that to happen. Because most companies don't look like Silicon Valley companies. Um, and so there, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in that area. I mean, I, I think we're in the early days of AI. Um, we are ourselves an AI human loop FinTech startup that happens to monetize with a venture fund. I mean, and we, we talk and look like it <laughs> internally. Um, and what's happening in venture is a tiny cottage industry and it's gonna happen in every industry. Um, so we're huge believers in that. I mean, we're, we're bearish short term on autonomy because I think it's gonna take a lot longer than most people think and there's a ton of political labor and you know, ethical ramifications of, of things like that. But these are gonna have tectonic shifts in like how people live and work inside of. And so those are the sort of the huge macro types of things that are happening and we're looking for people who are focusing on the construction industry um, and, and whatnot, I don't know where you are. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and areas that just haven't had, you know, even, even people with like, you know, like engineering or software, you know, backgrounds, they have IT staff. And, you know, they just haven't invested in rethinking their architecture and a lot of times they're more interested in protecting the sort of legacy of what they're doing than reinventing themselves. And that is like a massive opportunity. So we do a lot of like tech applied to like dusty old industry that hasn't seen a ton of innovation. And I just, I mean, Uber is a huge example of that. Like taxi dispatch, like people hated, you know, the taxi services. It was basically like quasi mafia driven. Yeah. And, you know, Uber has plenty of its own challenges, but I think it's fundamentally transformed reliability and predictability, safety, and lots of other things. And you see that in all sorts of verticals from Airbnb to 
you know, I mean, companies down to payments and, and every other area. So, I mean, I, I've never been more bullish in the number of ways that tech can be applied, but I think what's interesting for us is that, say 80% of the time, the buyer isn't an IT buyer. It's a business user of some kind or a consumer that's completely, re, you know, working with the company that's completely rethinking the entire stack. Or like key parts of it, and 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 bringing it much closer closer to the 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 actual user, and not some sort of centrally dominated procurement process that is like forced down top down on the end user. And you're and you're seeing that flourish from all over the place, from like the air tables of the world to, you know, uh, many many other applications. Hundred um, percent. Obviously, there's a number of folks in this room that are early in their uh, company's lifespan. And um, you know they're getting to product market fit, or might seem a glimmer, and really writing that. Um, you're obviously a successful founder, VC, and, and and you've been through this, or you've seen this many times. Um, is there any you know words of wisdom or words of advice that you give to folks in in this room who are kind of at this stage? Yeah, I would say, like first off, never compromise on team and culture as painful as it is to like move slower, getting the foundation of your company right is by far the most important thing. Um, and then after that, listen to the signals from customers, not just negative signals, but in particular positive signals, and see where they're pulling you. Because a bunch of the best you know, outcomes that I've been involved in uh, were founders that may have started with one idea and then they sort of found themselves pulled by their customers. Like, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting pain point. This is my real pain point. This is like my burning need. And they end up following those things. And once you get in that slipstream that sort of is, you know, that tailwind that helps accelerate and you're not fighting, you know, in, once you, once you get in and establish that point of entry, I mean, you can just continue to, to scale from there, but you're already embedded. Um, and so I, I really think the point of entry and, and really being laser sharp on where you, where you enter a market and what you're, you know, all of that, um, your go to market and everything around that, you know, the market gives you constant feedback on it. And, and I'll, don't take no easily, don't say that, but in particular, like seek the yes mm -hmm. and the hell yes, build this, you know, yeah. because you, you, you hear it from customers a lot, but it may be different than what they were building and they say no. Just make sure it's a pattern and not a one off thing that, that is happening. But if you start to hear consistency there, I, you know, you often uncover you know, a better entry point, which allows you to build a foundation and, and really scale mm -hmm. from there. So, um, you know, I, I think just being brutally honest about that stuff and very self-aware, because it's really easy to drink the Kool-Aid and like, yeah, this is our mission. And, you know, I mean, almost everything I've ever started or been involved with, like, evolved a ton. And hanging on to that initial idea or what you thought the world should look like too long, it was usually the wrong call and just, Accepting yes for an answer, <laughs> you know, was a, was a good way to go. And then from there, you can often find ways to, to, to expand to where you wanted to go in the first place. So maybe put the ego aside and see what the, what, what the market is telling yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just think it's be, you know, just listen a yeah. lot. And, you know, that doesn't mean don't have ambition, don't try to change the world, you know, do something incremental. But it's, it's start with where the customer really has a burning need and wants to buy. And then once you build trust and relationship with that customer, it's much easier to expand than starting with a place where, you know, it's not a huge pain point. They don't have budget. They're not willing to sort of meet you in the middle and take a leap of faith on your company. Where they are willing to take a leap of faith when your product's not quite ready or whatever, that's an indication that the pain point is so severe that they're willing to sort of suffer, you know, rough edges because, you know, the alternative is worse. Totally, totally. Um, so I have one last question, then obviously I want to open it up to the rest of you folks here. Um, was there one book that you read in your lifetime that kind of like shook you or maybe defined the way that you look at, at the world today? One book. Um, I, I, I am an insatiable learner. I mean, I've tried to pull from like so many different domains and like surround myself with like you know, the LP base that we have is like radically different than most venture funds. As a result, I've got some of the top quant hedge fund managers. I got a ton of like ex-Google people. I've got, you know, like all sorts of different people that like look at data and different aspects of what we do from radically different dimensions. 
And so I try to learn from all of them and I read books in like a huge array of domains. So I wouldn't say I can put a finger on like one book, but it's, it's more sort of pushing the edges in every direction of what are the best practices and who are the sort of greatest thinkers in all the different areas and then pulling together these myriad different perspectives to sort of come up with your own unique perspective for what is the task at hand. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to pin a single book, but maybe the book Innovation Entrepreneurship when I was like 10 years old or something like that from Peter Drucker was, you know, I really nice. knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur going way back. So yeah, that's powerful. It sounds like you've developed a pretty interesting platform to ingest uh, data, but let's say that this becomes something that becomes widely practiced because it's so successful. Do you see this as being uh, a continued point of differentiation for you and your firm? Um, to be totally candid, I'm not even remotely worried about competition. Um, this has proven to be like 10 times harder and the best legacy I could have is that the venture industry ends up being more focused on value add to entrepreneurs and, and doing a better job. Um, I, I, you know, for me, I'm much more worried about execution. Like, it's cute what we've done with like 20 companies with tons of resources. Now we're at 50 and 60 and I want to maintain our SLA. And you know, like it's clear line of sight to when it's going to be 100, 200 plus companies. And so we placed over 100 people in the portfolio last year. That's half as good as we need to be this year. And that's half as good as what we need to be next year. So I, you know, for me, it's, it's not a winner take all type of market. There's a natural sort of dozen plus firms that, that do very well um, in the category because you can't invest in competitors and there's different rounds and things like that. So you know, I, I find in general for most startups, it's kind of silly to worry too much. They, people worry way too much about the competitors. Um, Sometimes it's if they're like massively overcapitalized relative to you, but for the most part, that's as much a hindrance as it is, and you just got to be gorilla and figure out a way, your way around it. And so, so for me, it's just stay, don't get distracted by what other people are doing, and just focus on: Are we hitting our OKRs? Are we in every function? What's the MPS? Are founders getting value out of what we're doing? And you know, if we check the same box as other people and it's not valuable anymore, then we stop doing that and we find something else. There, there's plenty of pain points um, and not enough people really focused on doing it. So that's, it, it's great for us because it takes a village to build a company and tie the company around the company. And the more people, I would so sooner seek them out and want to work with them because they can help carry weight <laughs> than I'm worried about competing with them, to be honest. So weird question, but if you were to <clears throat> Say, give everyone in this room your toolkit for free. Yep. Do you think you'd be able to identify which of us are good founders just by looking at how we use the tools compared to your successful founders? It's a very interesting question. I've never actually thought about that. Um, so we use data, and we use systems and workflow and collaboration. I don't believe for a minute that that replaces human intuition. You can't tell the grit and determination of a founder. You can't tell their vision from the systems and from the data. Um, you know, there are interesting data sets that like, you know, in certain jobs, like just the mere fact that somebody doesn't use the default, you know, uh, browser or whatever it is was like an indicator of how, what kind of employee they were going to be. I mean, I think most of the people that you would strongly consider are highly accomplished and learners and all those types of things. And so, you know, it really, it really comes down to how much they're able to articulate their vision, how much they're able to go deep and understand the nuances and the politics and some of the sort of uh, business dynamics, structural dynamics of the industry that they're going after. And that they've really like completely studied the problem and it's not just service level. That's one of the biggest things we look for. And then also, you know, looking for how much have they been independently driven historically to succeed, take risks, those types of things. And so I don't think that's in the data. So to be totally candid, in the beginning, the system mostly alerts us that somebody who has an exceptional background is looking to start something, but it's a pretty big funnel. Um, and so then we filter down through human systems. So it's a human loop system. And then as you get more operational, those operational like sort of customer dynamics, the adoption curves, you can start to see the market dynamics on top of it. Um, but it starts very much driven by people, and 
you know, it, it's really about scalable support as much as it's not about like you're a 92 and she's a 78 and he's a hundred. That, that doesn't exist. And I think it's silly. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know that giving anyone the platform would al allow them to do that. But, you know, I mean, how, how, how well they recruit that founding team, how thoughtful they are about what they're looking for and why and tearing down their market, like that type of stuff is, is super interesting. And, and I don't know how to do that other than interviewing them. Maybe someone will figure out how to do this in an automated way, but it wouldn't be much fun either. <laughs> I'm curious if you allocate your fund differently given your, your edge on both data and service relative to other venture funds. Do you like, double down on, on founders that you've found for others, or how do you think about that? Yeah, Ooh, that's a good one. Um, we definitely do build a different portfolio construction. Uh, I think we end up going... Uh, earlier and taking more risk. I think that's one of the key learnings. I actually think that the risk of backing an amazing person and what you know at just the people level in the beginning and how they recruit early on. And if people are able to recruit amazing people, we're much more inclined to like really lean in on those companies. And almost all the market signal and everything else is ironically almost irrelevant. Um, you still want to understand the macro trends. Because so many of these companies change their business model and their tactics and their pricing and everything else. It's such early signal that it's more of a feedback signal than it is actual, you know, it's, it's pilots or whatever. And so I, I actually would have trouble doing Series A investing at this point. I'd rather just focus on team and the purity of that than like really nominal traction because it's, it's all going to change, you know, in so many ways. And if you look at all the great companies, I mean, look at Apple. Could you have possibly predicted where Apple is today from where it started, or Google, or Amazon, or any of these companies? That's all about team and who they build and how they sort of find opportunities they go, and they're able to capitalize on that opportunity. So, I mean, really, there's a lot of smart people, and you end up backing incredibly smart people that can't put the traction to ground, and they can't get great people to follow them in that vision, and it's really hard to sort of you know they they to 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 sort of throw a lot of money behind those types of things, but when they when they have a vision and they're able to get a great team together and and get customers and other people to believe in them, even if the traction is super early, like that that to me is incredibly compelling. Uh, given your focus on data, I'm curious how much of your interview of your sort of conversation with the founder is standardized or repeatable. Uh, not at all. <laughs> um, so we use the data in a different way in the very beginning. And so we graph how many points of connectivity we have to the person, and we do a lot more references on triangulating around them. And we actually are very structured in the way that we answer, uh, ask those references that are, that are uh, non-leading questions. You know, if they were this or that, like, and it's kind of ambiguous what you're looking for, and you start to get a very honest react reaction out of people. And so there's a bunch of things that we do, and we do definitely use data to figure out how to get the best inputs on that. We use it a lot for the competitors to understand sort of how they're doing in market. But a lot of times at seed, there's not a ton of data. And it wouldn't be that helpful, but the, at least from the sort of operational metrics of the business. But there is a ton of points of connectivity of people that knew them in all sorts of areas. And figuring out how the best way to get that information gives you the best perspective that you have. Because some people are great at interviewing, and other people are <coughs> awful at interviewing. And that's not necessarily correlated with how they are as leaders or how they are. They do have to be able to articulate what they're doing, but sometimes they just can articulate to a super technical crowd that they, and they just deeply understand that problem. And so you have to think of them differently than the sort of charismatic show person that you know, is able to sort of create a lot of heat and light, but not really able to think deeply about their space. So you talked a lot about scaling your company. Uh, I'm not sure if you're raising bigger fund and whatnot, uh, well, like what are the trade-offs of that? Like, so for example, Benchmark uh, is well known for having like small fund and investing in the same companies. Like what are the trade-offs there? Um, and also how do you find the right people? Is, is that through a network of, of uh, employees or is that uh, from deals or like how, how do you get uh, deals? All right, so a couple of questions in that, if I understand, is sort of uh, the second one was, was around deals, and the, and the first one was, I'm sorry, 
repeat. Uh, I lost it with the. Uh, you said that you're like you're planning to scale. Oh right, yeah. Right. Uh, like, what are the trade-offs? Uh, yeah. So I mean, so so benchmark is a is a very well run, purebred sort of uh, boutique venture fund, and so what I think they do well is they hire exceptional people early. They they're all equal partners. They don't promote them up and at like slow rates, and therefore like they blow out of there. They go after the best people they possibly can, and they default you know make them sort of full partners. In, in the fund, and they don't distract themselves with a bunch of other stuff. So we're like the polar opposite of that. We do all sorts of stuff, <laughs> um, which has its pros and cons. And so for us, I don't want to scale for the sake of like uh, hitting a number or a certain fund size or whatever. You know, we need to scale enough to be able to support our team, which we've done at this point. Um, but really, it's about what, what kind of capital do we need to be consistent with our strategy? And then how do we design the org? to be able to function at the budget that we have, um, which is different than what a lot of other venture funds do. They're like, I can raise more money, so I do. And they just become these huge funds, but then they abandon the sort of really early stage layer of working with founders because they can't effectively deploy checks at that side. So the huge trade-off of raising too much money is it makes it hard to actually work in my favorite part of venture, which is at the formation stage. And what was always frustrating me with it as being at a later stage fund was that the foundation is the most critical part. You can't build a really tall building without a great foundation. And if you're inheriting a building with a founder who did the best with what resources they had, but not as extensive a resources as a firm could have brought to them, you know, you're building on a, you know, a, a wobbly foundation. It's really hard to build a tall building and then retrofit the foundation <laughs> while the building is scaling. Um, so I just like getting involved earlier. I actually think it's less risky, ironically, than, the, than inheriting a company that sort of hasn't had all the resources that you could have brought to bear. Um, so we have a, a bit of a contrarian view there. Um, you know, and, and as far as, um, now I forgot the second question, sorry. Deals, uh, you know, we, we don't really care where deals come from. We, everyone asks us like, like, what percentage of your deals? It, it ends up being about a third today of the deals come from the system itself. Um, and so we track like 18 million companies and almost everyone founding companies and all the top technical talent and it's just alerts through a system. So think of it as almost like Palantir, like an anomaly detection system that alerts to a human. Um, so about a third comes from that, proactively from the system. I'd say originally a third came from the advisors and a third came from just we were wired into the venture community and people we backed or knew or people who knew us or got referred to us or whatever. Um, increasingly, there's also a founder layer of the founders bringing in a lot of people, so that's become a much bigger thing. So, you know, we definitely have a more automated technical layer of what we do that's significantly more than, or let's not non existent in other firms. Um, but we use the system and all of it, again, to sort of help with references, to understand benchmarking, competitive intelligence, those types of things. Um, so it's, it's part of everything, um, but it's not necessarily the source of everything. Yeah. Just talk a little like big picture and philosophically how you think about like retroactively looking back at deals you missed versus and how you take the signal from like the deals you missed and then apply that to like new things going forward without being like super reactionary, I guess. So I, I think the biggest signal in retrospect is all about team building. If they're able to get an amazing team, like you're not gonna be able to pick Zuck out of a stack, you know, of founders that were dropouts. But as they start to have amazing engineering teams coalesce, it's a meta signal that they're able to recruit and inspire the people below them. Um, and you know, the same was true of Dropbox or Stripe or a bunch of these. Like very early on, it was just exceptional engineering teams from day one. I, you know, I, I think in retrospect, we probably put too much emphasis on traction and not enough on team. Um, you don't want to do just team that never launches either. There's a balance in there. Um, but I, I would say, you know, it, we, we, we had a talent thesis going in, and if anything, we've doubled down on that thesis over time because, you know, a great, you know, there's 
stupid sayings in the industry like a great team with a B plan versus an okay team with an A plan. You know, the former team is going to beat the latter all day. You know, that kind of stuff. And I totally misquoted that, but you get the point. Um, and I, and I, but I do think there is, it's all about finding slipstreams in a market and figuring out where that point of entry is, where a customer demand is, where, where you know, there's a competitive void in the market. And people who are perpetual learners and very intellectually honest and can execute on serendipity when it happens, that's, that's what a lot of this is about. Um, most of the great companies didn't start with the thesis that they ended up with, but they had it generally right, and then they just sort of you know, pivoted or tacked or whatever you want to say until they sort of found the right course. And then when they had it, they had the right team in place and they could accelerate into that opportunity. And, you know, the rest is history, so. Okay, so outside of MPS, how do you measure the impact you have on founders and uh, your performance? So, so the good news is there's a ton of quantitative things you can look at. Number of people placed, intros, how much revenue that drove. Um, we do micro surveys after every advisor touch point bi-directionally, both to the advisor and the founder to understand like, is this founder, you know, prepared for the meeting? A lot of times the advisors are getting frustrated because they were just sort of haphazardly coming into the meeting and so it caused us to sort of push founders to be like, all right, you're meeting with someone whose time is very valuable. You know, how do we prep you to make sure you maximize their time? Because that was the point that, you know, the advisors feel much better about that if they feel like the, the, the student or the, the, the person on the other end is gaining value from that relationship. Um, and reciprocally, if advisors, you know, have a bunch of great war stories but aren't able to sort of adapt it to your circumstance or whatever, you know, or can't get tactical enough, they're, they're in fact too big an advisor and they're, you know, like, they're like, oh, well, you know, I would talk to someone three layers down from me and they would help me figure out how to tactically do it. You probably want the person three layers down that's actually going to figure out how to solve that. And so going for the biggest names is also not necessarily the right thing. So we have a bunch of lesser known people in the network that are closer to the bare metal where, you know, the founder lives. And so, you know, it's always an adjustment process on that. And also people go through waves of how much time they have. And so we measure all sorts of things from like meeting scheduling efficiency to you know, to, to uh, what the takeaways are and, and whether they execute on those things. So there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to measure beyond just the founder sentiment, but at the end of the day, that's a good meta signal that sort of rolls up the overall experience. Given all the data that you have, I'm actually curious um, how you make decisions around follow-on um, and kind of what the leading indicators um, that you're looking for with some of the earlier in the companies that you've backed. So... Um, we try to be super candid with founders on sort of where they are in market, what the milestones need to be for them to raise fallen money, generally not from us, but from, <laughs> from other people, um, and where we see, are seeing the milestones and those things shift. Um, at the end of the day, I've sort of every company is different, and we commit to do follow-on pretty much across the board for the entire portfolio, short of like c catastrophes. You know, I'm like clearly it's not working for anyone, in which case we like it's not a great use of the founder's time either because there's like like but we do definitely support universally, but that's different than sort of really leaning in and, you know, writing like massive super parata checks types of things. So, um, you know, so we just try to be I mean, honestly, it's like a very, you know, hopefully mature relationship where we're, we're very transparent about like where we think you know, a company needs to be in order to achieve their next milestones. And a lot of times they have competing bids and lots of options when that happens. And, and you know, then we have to fight to, to be one of those options that they choose to take. And sometimes that's the right choice for them. And other times they want to raise a bigger round or you get incremental people. And, you know, we're fine with any of those outcomes. We just want to make sure that, that our companies make it. And, and so far it seems to work. We've, you know, over 80% of the companies that we've seen have gone on to raise follow-on capital, which is about the highest in the entire industry. You won't, you won't like, use data to preempt growth rounds or anything like that? Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so do you get, like, alerts that it's, like, this company's breaking out or something, like, before anyone really knows that that's happening? I don't know that you're doing any favors to the founder to, like, preempt, and I, don't, I think most founders are hopefully savvy enough that... 
you know, that the, the preemption only works if they feel like they've got what they need around the table. Um, I, I actually think the main reason where we end up sort of competing with an upstream round is when bringing in a new player, they need so much ownership that the dilution that they're going to take of them plus pro rata is like, you know, 30% of the company. And it's like, why would you take that much dilution? You got here on $3 million. You've got six months of runway because you don't wait till you're on vapors to go fundraise. They need you to rate, like take a $10 million, $15 million check because they need certain ownership to justify the board seat or whatever. Like, if you need that money, great, go do that. But if you don't need that money, what could you do with a few more milestones? Right now you're hitting the bar to raise money. Why not like clear the bar significantly and then create a feeding frenzy upstream? And so we'll often you know, bridge an extra four, six, eight months. Not so much because they like can't raise money, but because they can raise money on like far more advantageous terms that are less dilutive for everyone. And because we're an early investor, we're very aligned. With them. So we're fortunate that we have enough capital that we can sort of support through that journey. But there are plenty of times when they're like progressing well, but they're not quite at the bar that we also sort of help to nudge them over the line. And so, you know, we, you know, it, it's, it's hopefully very much a partnership between the two and we're have a constant dialogue about when is the right time to raise money. And I think the bar for the later stage for the average companies is raising like $6 million before their A, which really means that the A is the B. You know what I mean? And so like the sands keep shifting as these guys are all looking up at the sun. And by that, I mean Masayoshi sun, um, you know, up there <laughs> writing, you know, huge checks and they're raising huge growth funds. I mean, they just slip farther and farther. They're more worried about making sure they pick the winner and they're sort of heat chasing. Um, then they are focused on like, you know, is this the, you know, can I build a lot of value with the founders, you know, at this stage? And you know, and I, and I think that's a, it's a disappointing thing that a lot of great firms have sort of shifted up too much and they're, they're just, they're too momentum seeking. Um, the good news is there's a lot of, a whole ecosystem of people that are sort of filling the void um, to help out in the middle. Um, and that's a great thing for founders. They have more options than ever. Now you talked about um, kind of founders' ability to recruit and put teams around them as kind of the key signal for you. We just spoke about investing in formation. How do you get a read on that when you're looking at just the founding team or just two founders or three founders? Well, I mean, we see it over time, right? In the beginning, often they've run teams in other companies or they've started a nonprofit and recruited people. I mean, there's usually some signal of them taking a leadership role and being inspirational to other people. If there's literally none of that, it's really hard, you know, uh, if they've never been in a leadership role in their life. You know, it, it's it's... That's, that's a tough uh, founder to back unless they really are just a complete domain expert in what they're doing and, and then just the bar becomes extra high there. Uh, but early on, you, you see that with how they're building the team and we're very involved in helping them build the team. So you know, the, the double benefit of that is it gives us visibility in the culture and things like that. And we're very active in trying to help them think through, okay, how do you think through you know, how to build a diverse team that comes from all sorts of different perspectives, that all sorts of different backgrounds. They're going to help you eliminate blind spots and be more thoughtful about seeing those opportunities. And, you know, are these the type of people that you need to bring? That any, Are you willing to hire people that are better than you under you? Because that's ultimately what you need to succeed, um, is be willing to be threatened and, and hire people that could do parts of your job, maybe not all of your job, hopefully not all of your job, the parts of your job better than you can. And those are like clear signs of people who, you know, are confident and have the ambition to do things. And if they hire, you know, people who are, you know, much more sort of yes people, you know, around them because, you know, that's what they need, that's much more of a warning sign. Chris, thank you so much. <laughs>